Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn now in our study to Virgil's Aeneid. You uh, will be, I hope, uh, already along with me for the ride uh, for uh, the study of both Iliad as well as Odyssey. And now we turn uh, to Virgil's Aeneid. Now, if you haven't been following my stuff at LearnStrong.net, I recommend that you do so. Go to the AP folder. Watch my lectures on the Iliad and the Odyssey because my assumption is that you've been following that work. In fact, for AP English, we spent a little time with Edith Hamilton's mythology and then we turn to a guided study of the Iliad and the Odyssey. We now leave our Homer and step into the Roman world of Virgil. Now, in this intro lecture, I want to do at least four things if I could, and I hope that I can get this done in the amount of time that I have. First, I want to very briefly review Roman history because it's so important that we have some sense of that. Then we want to discuss Virgil as a Roman poet, as opposed to Homer, who is a Greek poet, whoever Homer is, and there already is one of the major distinctions between the Aeneid and the two Homeric texts. We already commented on the fact that there's a huge debate about who Homer was, and even did the same person write both the Iliad and the Odyssey. One of the things we know about Virgil is that, and the Aeneid is that Virgil is the sole poet. He sits down to actually craft and create a poem, borrowing heavily from not just the Homeric tradition of the Iliad and the Odyssey, but as well a whole bunch of other Greek kinds of stories as well that we would call collectively Greek mythology. After we talk about Virgil, we'll talk about the primary plot line and we'll divide the Aeneid up into three parts quickly. The 12 books, half the number of books of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And then finally, we'll outline our study very similar to our approach that we took with the Iliad and the Odyssey to finish what is sometimes referred to as the Holy Trinity of great Western epics, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. Everything, of course, for us is built on our learning theory and our annotative work and theory, and we'll obviously finish with that. Now, let's talk really quickly about the Romans. Well, um, my assumption is that you've already had a history class where they've taught you about the rise of the great Roman people, but let's just give a bit of review by the fourth century Philip of Macedon and, of course, Alexander the Great have dominated Greece, and this is the beginning of what we will call the Hellenistic Age, which will last until scholars like to call it 31 BCE. The rise of Rome has always been a huge debated topic in terms of when you start actually measuring it, and, of course, the fall of Rome is as well the same way. 753, though, BCE is usually the date that's given for the rise of Rome with Romulus killing his brother Remus, which is why we call them Romans and not Remans, right, and all of that. Brother killing brother, that's significant because, of course, when we pick up our biblical text and read it, we know that the first murderer in the Bible is Cain killing Abel. We have the same game being played. After the rise of Romulus, we will have the kings that will rule Rome for a while, and that's significant for your notes because if there's anything that the Romans have a clear aversion to. You know this from your study in your sophomore year of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. It is the Romans hate the idea of a king. They never want a king. The irony, of course, of all ironies is that they inherit emperors which are in some ways even worse than kings. But we will usually say that about 509 BCE, Rome becomes a republic and then it begins its great march towards becoming the great republic, the great empire of the known world. All of that has to do with the opening lines of the Aeneid, an ancient city, not the city of Rome, but rather the city of Carthage. Now these wars are called Punic Wars, uh, and, and instead of Carthaginian Wars or Carthaginian Wars. Um, and there's three of them, as you know, just to remind. 264 to 241, remember we're counting down, is the first Punic War. The second Punic War is probably the most famous because this is when Hannibal brings his elephants to over the Alps and all of that. That was from 218 to 202. The final, though, war is the one that ends it all. And Cato would always get in front of the Romans, as you'll maybe remember from your history class, and he would always end whatever he was saying by saying, and we've got to defeat those, Car the, those uh, people of Carthage. And uh, in 155 and 146, we have the end of Carthage. Some have argued that this was the beginning of the end for Rome, that once they lost the true foil, that other great empire um, of, uh, of um, Carthage, that Rome had nobody to fight anymore, and so they began to kind of lose their way. It's an interesting argument, but 
from 146 on, we have then the growing total domination of Rome. Of course, May 5th, uh, March 15th, the Ides of March uh, 44 BCE, Julius Caesar ends up getting jacked by his pals Brutus and, and the rest of them, Cassius. And we know about that from our study of Shakespeare's play. What led up to that was, of course, civil war. What followed that was, of course, civil war. And Rome has this intense history of having these kinds of skirmish conflicts that erupt and then will define much of their politics. Mark Anthony, of course, after Julius Caesar dies, Mark Anthony versus Octavian, who later called Augustus uh, Caesar, of course, adopting Julius Caesar's name, the great nephew, of course, and adopted son of Julius Caesar. Mark Anthony ends up, as you know, of course, the famous story, in Egypt, falling in love with Cleopatra, the lover of one time Julius Caesar, and down there, um, falling in love with Cleopatra, Romans will often say that he was destroyed and ruined. For your notes, by the way, and many scholars have pointed this out, that with Mark Anthony and his uh, associations, flirtations with uh, Cleopatra in the East, this is the beginning of Roman suspicion about the West. And it only translates, years later, into a suspicion by England of all things East, and of course, once those English men and women come to the American colonies, the Americans all um, having a suspicion of all things East. It's an ongoing kind of thing, and it certainly happens during this time. 31 BC um, is, is a huge moment, right, because Octavia then will defeat Mark Anthony and Cleopatra in 31 uh, BC at the Battle of Octavian, and it will be there that the end of the Hellenistic Age is marked and the rise, of course, of Caesar Augustus. He's named that in 27 BC, given that title. He is the sole ruler then until AD 14 when he dies. Now, he never actually calls himself a king or an emperor. There are terms that are bestowed upon him, however, like Augustus, which basically lets everybody know he knows he runs the show. He wanted to restore, uh, Octavian uh, Caesar Augustus, wanted to restore old Roman virtues, while at the same time he wanted to celebrate the arts. And so to that degree, he didn't actually commission Virgil to write uh, the Aeneid, but he certainly encouraged Virgil through uh, mutual friends and the like to say a poem should be written that would basically give the Romans their Plymouth Rock story, as I sometimes have called it. Um, every culture needs to have a story about where it comes from. Watch this. The Romans, for example, can destroy a tribe. And then the tribe will ask, who are you people? We're Romans. Well, yeah, I know that, but where'd you come from? Like, what's the story of your origin? And the Romans had answers to that, but none of those had been well qualified in the form of a brilliant poem. And that's what Virgil gave to the Romans. Well, let's talk about Virgil. There's this interesting legend that comes down to us through one of his biographers that his mother had this amazing dream where she actually didn't give birth to a child. She gave birth to a laurel branch. The minute it touched the earth, it rooted and then it sprung into full bloom, all kinds of flowers, all kinds of fruits. And then the next day, Virgil was born in a ditch on the side of the road. I mean, how true a story like this is, who knows. But, I mean, it makes for good drama, right? He is born. Um, uh, Virgil is born October 15th of 70 BC. He dies the 21st of September 19 BC on his way back to Rome when he had been caught up uh, in, a, in a journey and then suggested by Octavian that he return. Think about all the important history then that we just outlined that he lived through. And let's say it for our notes that Virgil is the great lover of Rome. He is a true believer that Rome is the greatest civilization in the history of the world, either that has been or importantly for our poem and the study of the Aeneid, ever will be. From 30 to 19, so during those years, um, Virgil writes the Aeneid. Now, we don't have contemporaries telling us a lot about how Virgil wrote and things like that. Long after the fact, we have some people that comment on the way Virgil wrote um, and the quiet life that he lived as he wrote this, this poem. He had other offerings, other poems that he had worked with before, two um, great ones before, um, the, the Georgics as well as the Echologues. But really, the Aeneid is what defines Virgil as Virgil. Uh, and so in, he's writing it when he dies in 19. It really is the epic poem about the birth of the Roman people, as well as, of course, the hero Aeneas. Um, at his death, interestingly, Virgil requests that the poem be destroyed. And because he argues that it's not finished, scholars of this poem have 
pointed out how remarkable, it's a brilliant poem, in the Latin translated, we'll be again using the Fagel's translation just like we did for the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's a brilliant poem, but many have wondered how much better it would have been if Virgil could have remained alive to uh, take care of it. For example, he was, when he died, he was headed down to Greece to do recon, actually, on, to get ready to write some of the sections about Greece that are mentioned in the poem. So he took this very seriously. The influence of this poem cannot be overstated. Um, uh, St. Augustine, when we meet him in his confessions, St. Augustine will say that he was raised on Virgil, as, was, as were all young Roman schoolboys. Of course, when we meet Dante, and especially the Inferno in our AP study, well, Dante's Inferno is born of Book Six of the Aeneid. Interestingly, scholars argue that Dante never actually read Homer. What he read was Virgil. And you've got this really amazing thing where the, the, uh, with the fall of Rome post 400 and the rise of Christianity, you've got the rise of the Christian church, the Roman Catholic church, but they will give tremendous credence to the poetry of Virgil. There's a couple of reasons for this. Virgil um, in, in Ecologue 4 makes some reference to someone that's about to be born that will be really important and many Christians from the very early days thought that he was referencing Jesus Christ without even realizing that's what he was doing. But sitting on pulpits in cathedrals all over Europe was in fact a Bible and Virgil's Aeneid. And they would play this game called the Virgilian Lottery, that's sometimes in translation how it's understood, where you could open any page of the Aeneid, point to a passage and read it out loud and it would give you some help in terms of knowing either the future or qualifying some experience of the present. That is to say, Virgil came, comes to be known as the Roman Homer, right? And thankfully, Augustus did not destroy the poem. It's published at about 18 BCE, and it immediately becomes a phenom. It immediately becomes the poem of all poems. Well, what is it? Well, it is a poem, and it is an epic poem. So we're going to have all of the same kinds of things that we saw with both the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's a poem about a great Trojan warrior Aeneas. Now you'll maybe remember that we saw Aeneas in the Iliad and there were mentions made of him, right? First of all, and it's interesting what those mentions are because we don't see a lot of them, but for sure um, in, in Iliad 5 you'll maybe remember that he is rescued from Diomedes who's about to kill him in, in, in Iliad 5 uh, line 495 and following. But more significantly for our study, and you'll remember that you go back to the Iliad Book 20 lecture, and you'll, you'll um, see my, my comments here in full. But Iliad 20, starting at line um, um, 349 or so, um, we have this really interesting idea. Um, um, Achilles is fighting against Aeneas and is ready to kill him. You'll remember Achilles is on the rampage, right, because he lost his friend Patroclus. Poseidon, Neptune in the, uh, in the Aeneid, Poseidon will in fact comment on, first of all, Aeneas' piety. This is huge because he's always sacrificing to the gods, giving them gifts, warming their hearts, that kind of thing. At 345 he says, gifts for the gods who rule the vaunting skies. But then something really important gets said at line 349 of Iliad 20. He says it this way, Aeneas is destined to survive. That's why Poseidon says we cannot let him die to, to Achilles' weapon. Yes, he says, so the generation of Dardanus, that is to say Dardanus is the inventor of Troy, shall not perish. Dardanus, dearest to Zeus of all the sons that mortal women brought to birth for father. So in other words, here in the Iliad we have a reference to the fact that Aeneas must survive because he's going to grow on to, to make this great city. Well, it was already kind of talked of that the Roman people were clearly amazing people and therefore they had to come from somewhere and this uh, reference in the poem was an easy reference and no question Virgil is certainly going to play the game. Well, what is the Aeneid about? Well, it's a story about a pious hero. By here pious we mean respectful to the gods. We also mean dutiful, write that term down. When we later talk about our Immanuel Kant and the notion of duty, we'll come back to this idea of duty. When we meet, for example, Beowulf in the very beginning of that poem, and he says that it is his duty, according to his people back in the land of the Geats, to come and help the Danes. That word duty will derive in large measure from this notion of Aeneas. Dutiful will, uh, will mean as well that he has a duty to settle the great city and create the great city that ultimately will be the great city of Rome. 
In the opening lines of Aeneid 1, lines that we will study here in a little bit, we're going to hear that it's about wars and a man, I sing, is the way Fagels will translate this opening line. When we're mentioning wars, immediately we think about Achilles and the Iliad. When we mention man, we immediately think about Odysseus, the suffering hero, who of course loves poets, as we saw with his love of uh, Demodocus and, and, and Phineas, the, the poet he saves at the end of the Odyssey. Some have argued, and, and, and it's an easy way to think about the Aeneid. It's a simpleton way, but let's put it in our notes. That books one through six of the Aeneid are basically a Virgil's attempt to rewrite the Odyssey. And books seven through 12 are Virgil's attempt to rewrite the Aeneid. The heart of the poem is in fact book six, a journey into the underworld and it will be there that we really do get come to full fruition in the ways in which Virgil will combine and transcend Homer. I think that's important we say it that way. It's not just that Virgil is going to simply recreate Homer. No, 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 no. He's far more sophisticated than that. It's a pretty sophomoric reading to simply say that Virgil steals everything Homer does. What we would say is he adapts it but he adapts it for powerful political reasons, as we'll point out as we go through the poem. By the way, the poem is self-evidently a Roman poem about Romans by a Roman poet. No question about it at all. Well, how do we understand the poem in terms of its most simple kinds of understandings? It's a three-part poem for your notes. Now, I'm going to summarize 12 books here very, very quickly, but let's play the game. Books one through four, we have the journey from Troy ultimately to Carthage, and the love story with the famous Dido. Part two, books five and six, we are in Sicily, and there we have the journey to the underworld, which is in many ways really the key to the poem. Why? In the underworld, now, and of course we'll immediately think about the Odyssey and book, and book 11 and the journey into the underworld and all of that. In the, in the Aeneid, though, the journey to the underworld allows Aeneas to see the future, and we will have a Roman poet who will in fact talk about everything that's come before and everything that's about to happen. And it's all going to be that Rome looks up. It's going to be a great moment in the history of the Roman world when Virgil is able to say, we've got the greatest of everything. And of course, Augustus is the greatest of everything. Then we turn to the third and final part of the book, book 7 through 12. These are all of the battles against the Latin, the Latins, the, the Latins, um, and ultimately Aeneas will defeat Turnus at the very end of the poem. The way, the way the poem ends is almost abrupt. Aeneas will kill the, the, the one arch villain, if you want to think of him that way. But we're also going to have an interesting moment, an exchange between, the, uh, between uh, um, 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 Jupiter, not Zeus, but Jupiter, and not Hera, but Juno, uh, uh, between um, um, king god and queen god about what it means that Aeneas has won. And the decision is, is made that the Trojans will win, but they're not going to be called Trojans anymore. They're going to be called Latins. And of course, this is the birth of the Roman people. And finally, we get the sense that we're told the Romans are going to dominate forever. Now, let's think about the gods since I mentioned them for a moment. In the Iliad and the Odyssey, he's Zeus. In the Aeneid, he's Jupiter. In the Iliad and the Odyssey, she's Hera. In the Aeneid, she's Juno. In the Iliad and the Odyssey, she's Aphrodite. And in, Aeneas, and, and in the Aeneid, she is Venus, the mother, of course, of Aeneas. In the Iliad and the Odyssey, she's Athena. In the Aeneid, she's Minerva. And, and on and on it goes, right? It's in the Iliad and the Odyssey, he's Poseidon. And of course, in the Aeneid, it's Neptune. And on and on it goes. This is why our study of Edith Hamilton's mythology, especially that first chapter, is so important. Because we see how the, how the Romans will just adopt in many ways these gods and goddesses and then just rename them, okay? Why is that important? Because in the same way that we were playing the game in the Iliad and then in the, uh, and then, and then in the Odyssey, we've got the blame game one more time. The blame game cutting both ways. Why are the Romans the greatest people in the history of the world? I mean, Virgil looks around and he says, obviously we're the most dominant nation in the world. Why? And the answer is the gods. Of course, the other side is the theodicy question as we've articulated it already. Why does bad stuff happen to good people? Why is it that a pious hero like Aeneas is going to have terrible things happen to him? 
and the suffering of humans, why do you, can you explain that? And the question is, well, is it the God's fault? You'll remember in the opening lines of the Odyssey, Zeus said, it's not my fault that Aegisthus and all these humans have all this suffering that happens to them. And of course, we picked up with that during our conversations about these poor suitors that all got jacked, you know, something awful. The question is obviously, and it was the question that was asked a number of times from the Homeric poems and as well from uh, Virgil's poem as well. Are these gods that are, ex that are described worthy of respect, worthy of worship, worthy of fear? Uh, the Romans certainly seem to think so. Okay, let's talk really quickly about how we're going to approach our study. Very similar to the Iliad and the Odyssey study. My assumption, and this is huge, my assumption is that you've already done that study, both as reading those texts and as flowing my lectures that are available online at learnstrong.net in the AP folder. My goal for you is always to read this material on your own first and then come to my lectures to use me, as I've said before. Some of you smiling because, of course, I keep reiterating this. I'm not just here to tell you the story. I hope that you read the story on your own and then let me help you to read the story better. Of course, our learning theory is hypercritical, so let's review it one more time. Our goal is always to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. And we do that primarily in our reading approach, what we call annotation, by asking three guiding questions. Level one, reading, what does the text say? Now we're just summarizing. Level two, what does the text mean? At 2A, themes, messages. At 2B, we're going to go ahead and stay with our structure of the Iliad and the Odyssey lectures, where at 2B, the rhetorical level, not what the poet says, but how the poet says it. That is to say, we'll concentrate on symbolism and irony, both of those hypercritical for our study of all three of these great epic poems. Finally, at level three, we'll ask the question, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? At 3A, how can I relate this information of the Aeneid to other texts that I'm familiar with? It's amazing to me the number of students who, when they study the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid with me, and they're huge gamers, they will say, well, almost all of the storylines that I'm playing games to have somehow relationships to these three epic poems. That is right, because these are really famous, of course, poems. And for us at 3A, 